Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be delving into what was originally conceived to be the finale of the entire story, the Alexandria Safe Zone. And before we delve any deeper into it, I want to preface this by saying that this arc has a ton of very subtle changes that really change the way you'll see the story. I will of course try to paint as clear of a picture as I can, but keep in mind that this arc is where a lot of the differences in the story so far come together and all in all make for quite a different take on it. But with that said, let us dive in. Alright I lied, there's still one thing that I want to mention before we get into the story itself, and that is the poster for the latter half of season 5. And while yes, this is just an awesome poster all around, there's also a particular detail of interest in the background that you may overlook. If you look at the top left corner, you might notice a building that looks somewhat familiar. And there's a good reason for that, because that might be the Sanctuary, or in other words, Negan's home base. As far as I know, it's never really been confirmed and it may just be a huge coincidence, especially because the saviors in the TV version are still a ways off, but my headcanon says that it is indeed an easter egg for the comic book folks. If you ask me, it looks way too similar not to be. Though only the producers know for sure and either way, that's just a fun fact. Moving closer to the story, as I mentioned briefly in the previous part of the series, we opened the latter half of the season with yet another highly controversial episode. What happened and what's going on? This one was even teased by Kirkman himself as one that would split viewers. And needless to say, he was right on the money. The controversy of this episode of course stems from Tyrese's death. Coming off of the quite bleak demise of Beth, I think most viewers didn't expect another death of this scale anytime soon. Let alone in such a surprising and brutal manner. The episode itself, in my opinion at least, is unquestionably beautiful, both because of its cyclical narrative, where the episode opens with blatantly hinting at a death which you'd initially believe to be Beth, though once you get to the end, you realize that that was Tyrese all along. And secondly, because of how the death itself is handled. We'll talk about it a bit more in just a second, though I think as far as emotional weight goes, Tyrese's death is definitely up there in the TV version. In terms of story, this episode's premise initially is laid out as a detour to Noah's hometown, and so we see the group arrive at Shire Wilt Estates. The name of the town, as we've talked about before, is of course a reference to the Wiltshire Estates from way back in the comic book. Though importantly, in case you've forgotten, this entire thing is exclusive to the adaptation. In the books, Aaron has already made his appearance and we stop the story there. So in the TV version, everyone, including the comic book readers, were going in completely blind. And just before we get to Tyrese, there are still a couple of more interesting things to mention here. Firstly, if you're paying close attention to the background, you will begin to notice several instances of the same phrase appearing in various locations. Wolves not far. This is of course in reference to the villains we'd meet later in the season and in early season 6. But, because this too is a TV show add-in, I still remember everyone scrambling as to what that may mean. As we'll talk about in a bit, after the group gets to Alexandria in the book, the saviors pretty much show up straight away. Whereas in the TV show, it seemed like a whole new group would appear before then. And based on how well Terminus was written, many viewers, including myself, were more than a little excited to see how this plays out. And in a broader sense, Dropping easter eggs in the background hinting at future events is just a thing I love when shows do. So it's just a double win for me. But secondly, also in a similar vein, you will probably notice that it just so happens to once again be Glenn who gets a baseball bat. As I just mentioned, with comic book readers expecting the saviors and Negan to appear pretty soon, Glenn almost being bonked in Terminus and now getting another baseball bat just seemed like blatant foreshadowing to that fateful day. Though yeah, that's just a fun little detail. As for Tyrese, 
in the episode, he himself pretty much spells out that his narrative arc has concluded. As he tells Noah that even after losing Karen and supposedly Sasha, he never gave up and protected Judith after the prison. And it's because of him not giving up that she's alive and reunited with her father today. So yes, that is pretty blatantly telling that he has achieved his goal. And with that, they both head off to Noah's house where, while distracted by a photo, Tyrese is bitten. What follows is one of the most, almost melancholy events in the series. Like he himself just said, he never gave up and that ultimately led him to save Judith, the only real glimmer of hope in the apocalypse all while never giving up his morality. In terms of a character arc, that does neatly wrap it up, but it still doesn't make this any easier to watch. Especially with almost the entire episode being his final send-off, as, just like Tyrese, we drift in and out of these dream sequences. And better yet, we see a bunch of characters important for Tyrese appear in these hallucinations. Martin, who calls Tyrese out for not killing him, saying Gareth couldn't have tracked them down if he did. Then Bob appears, then on the radio we hear this man who sounds eerily familiar and yes, in case you didn't pick up on it, whenever we hear the radio in this episode, that is Andrew Lincoln speaking in his natural British accent. Carrying out revenge attacks involving hacking innocents with machetes, this show has with the fans here, and as soon as it finished. Though what he describes is the most interesting part. As he says people were hatched up with machetes, clearly describing the events of the church. But then of course, there's the big one. David Morsi reprising his role as the governor. And that's the thing about doing live action shows. Getting actors to return is never easy, so whenever they manage to pull it off, especially in a case like this where that was for just a few short scenes, I am all in. And as if this entire thing wasn't bad enough, we see Beth appear, reopening that wound of the episode before straight away. And the extreme whiplash of his loved ones all saying, it's okay Tyrese, only for Martin to butt in and basically call Tyrese weak. But okay, I could gush about the scene for another hour, because the amount of details packed in here are truly nuts. But what I think I loved here the most is the final moments of it, as we see the line between his dreams and reality finally be broken. You get the extremely sorrowful and almost hopeless tone as Lizzie and Mika hold his arm, only for that to be completely flipped on its head as Rick screams to cut it off. This is a remix to what happens with Morgan, but we'll get to that in due time. But just as abruptly as Rick's appearance, we're once again back to that hopeless tone, as we see countless events spliced together. The prison, the governor, Bob, the group saving him, Beth. It all just melds together until we cut to him in the car, hearing the radio again. He then says to turn it off, and the car stops as we see his body carried out. All the while we hear this ambient music that is sort of conflicting in its emotions. It's sort of peaceful, but at the same time it's, it's hollow. And with that, we finally return to the very first scene of the episode, Tyrese's burial. And in case this episode wasn't messed up enough yet, Instead of the usual credits music, all we hear is complete silence as Rick shovels dirt into the grave. I mean, can you blame super casual viewers for tuning out at this point? This was seriously a messed up episode in every sense of the word. I know quite a few comic book readers consider Tyrese in the books to be a far better character, and while I do agree with the sentiment that a lot of what we saw in the books was simply given to Daryl and that by default weakened Tyrese in the TV version, I did still really like his character in the adaptation. He's obviously much, much different, but I still really enjoyed seeing him. 
And I think most people would agree that seeing the person who saved Judith die just before they reach Alexandria of all places is absolutely tragic. And the entire episode being focused on that is just a solid handful of salt in that wound. Following the absolute emotional blasting that was the mid-season premiere, we enter a stretch of what I genuinely believe to be nearly perfect episodes. And it's also here where one of the most iconic and in my opinion greatest shots of the group happens. Personally, this is 100% what I think of when I imagine Rick's group. And from what I've seen, this isn't an uncommon belief. Oh, and in case you didn't think the mid-season premiere was too emotional, let me just adjust this image for you real quick. I really miss those days. Moving closer to the story though, as you'd expect, a lot of the immediate character arcs revolve around the people they've just lost. Sasha is obviously hurting over losing Bob and Tyrese basically back to back. Maggie and Daryl are both still devastated by Beth's death and things generally seem quite bleak. And I think if you look at it in the sense that all of this was setting up the intense contrast once we reach Alexandria, then I can see how these very dark episodes were absolutely necessary. Though as we talked about at length in the previous parts, all of that comes with the risk of losing viewers along the way. In case you didn't tune into that conversation, for people like me, and most likely you since you're actively seeking out more Walking Dead content which automatically makes you more invested in the franchise, character deaths are probably not going to be the thing that makes you drop off of a series. But for the silent masses, they may do. But in terms of some notable changes, arguably the biggest one here is Maggie. If you recall what happened earlier in the comic book when they begun their way to Washington, while she is somewhat detached from everything in the adaptation, it's never nearly as bad as it was in the book. And as I already talked way back then, I much prefer the TV version in this regard. And that will only become more pronounced as we get to Alexandria. Soon thereafter, a massive storm starts, so the group holds up in a barn. And it's here where the TV version of the famous scene happens, as Rick proclaims that they are the Walking Dead. And I know that so far I've usually said that, oh, I like the comic better here and the TV version better here, which does put me on the wrong side of basically everyone, but I'm sorry I can't take a side here. They're so different, yet so, so impactful that I just can't pick a favorite. I love Feral Rick as much as everyone, but the comics version was just so great for me that they're basically equal. If you happen to prefer one, purely out of curiosity, I'd love to hear why. Oh, and side notes, I wasn't kidding, because this is the internet, according to some people I hate both the comic book as well as the TV version, as I apparently keep saying that I only prefer one of them. Which I think I clearly don't, but alright. And I guess on a similar note, one aspect of the show that I loved here was how symbolic the end of the storm is here. Sasha and Maggie, both of whom have just lost their siblings, are the first ones in the morning to leave the barn, only to see that all the walkers have been totally wiped out by the storm. If you ask me, the peaceful, almost angelic music in the early sunrise and the absolute devastation that has happened, yet left the barn completely untouched, while wiping out the threats, almost signifies the help of a higher power. And that would ultimately culminate as we see this picturesque scene of them watching the sunrise, as Aaron, clean and neatly dressed, which is obviously a far cry from the group, appears claiming to be a friend and offering good news. And so with that, the proverbial and also the literal storm has indeed ended, as the group hears of what was thought to be impossible, a safe haven. And with that, we have finally caught up with the book, and fittingly, let's address those events first. He introduces himself, asking to talk to the leader of the group. Rick, on the other hand, doesn't really feel like talking just yet, and knocks him out. And even Abraham's like, that look I gave you meant chill, not knock him out. 
But anyway, once he awakens, he begins to explain what he's about. He's a recruiter of a community near Washington, consisting of around 40 people. He then continues by saying that he's been following the group for a while already to see if they'd fit in, calling back to the whole Carl not liking oatmeal conversation, etc., but says that he's certain they'd make a good addition. Obviously, Rick is more than a little reluctant to believe him right away, though before they can even make a solid decision, the group is attacked by a group of walkers. Once again, notice Carl here having zero problem springing into action. Though because they just keep on coming, all of the group jumps in to help. And when the walkers are seemingly dealt with, they turn around to see Aaron with a gun, and Glenn saying that he gave it to him because they were having trouble. There is a bit of a funny line as Rick asks, Did you have to give him that gun? As Glenn himself has a pistol while Aaron's standing there with an automatic rifle. But, to prove his honesty, Aaron immediately gives it up. And before we continue with that, let us tackle his arrival in the adaptation. First off, instead of appearing to the entire group, he greets just Sasha and Maggie. Though very similar to the book, says that he's a friend and asks to see Rick. Soon thereafter, he's brought to the barn where he meets the rest of the group. And one detail to mention here is the fact that Judith is still in the story which creates this very pronounced contrast in Rick, similar to what I mentioned with the Hunters. Obviously, we know Aaron did come as a friend, but clearly he's more than a little scared as any person would be. Especially when you see Rick, a dude that looks more than a little scary. And so, once again you get those two sides of Rick. One caring for Judith, while the other has already readied their gun for whatever happens next. There are also a few more light-hearted lines added to their initial conversation. Similar to the book, he still points out the word audition as sounding weird in the context of what they do, though in the TV version, he also adds that it makes it sound like they're some sort of dance group. But that only happens on Friday nights. And again, the juxtaposition here is very, very pronounced as we just cut back to the group who are like, what? He also gives them photos right away. Though as he begins his PowerPoint presentation of saying how safe they are, etc, etc, Rick calmly walks up to him and knocks him out. Following this, there are a few more minor changes in the adaptation. A thing that I didn't bring up before is that the survivors were left water on the roads. This was of course done by Aaron and he mentions that here. Just like in the book, he then follows up by explaining that he has been following them for a while to see how capable they are, and because he was impressed by them, that is why he's here. Another minor change is that Rick asks him how many people are out there right away, to which Aaron answers just one. And I brought this up because this would come as a surprise to them in the book, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. And the last thing here is an addition that I really enjoyed. In both versions, they obviously questioned the validity of Aaron's claims. But in the adaptation, he outright tells them, Look, if I were to ambush you, I'd do it here. I'd just pick you off as you ran through the only exits. As I said, I have been following you for a while. And for me at least, these lines do immediately remove a ton of doubt surrounding his claims. Because yes, he could have easily picked them off. In the comic, on the other hand, that trust was more so established with him giving up the gun, and that is also something we would see later in the TV version. Following this, in both versions, Michonne speaks up saying that Rick is being way too cautious and that she can tell Aaron is being truthful. In the adaptation, the confrontation is more so a serious and calm exchange, where Michonne just says we're going to check it out and everyone slowly agreeing with her, while in the book, it's a bit more emotionally charged as Michonne says that she doesn't even care about anyone else. She's going with him and if anyone wants to join, they're free to do so. It still has the same net effect of questioning Rick's leadership, but the approach is a little bit different. And what comes next is also a little bit different in the two versions. In the book, Rick simply says, Okay, if that's what everyone wants, we're leaving at first light and they all join up with Aaron. In the adaptation, on the other hand, remember that Aaron told them there's another person waiting for him. 
And so a smaller group consisting of Abraham, Maggie, Glenn, Michonne and Rosita split off to go and verify that they did indeed arrive in the cars that he said they did. Meanwhile back at the barn, we see Rick stay behind with Aaron where we get another scene that further worked to remove the mystique surrounding his claims. As Judith begins to cry, Aaron tells Rick to get her some of the applesauce he had with him. Rick being Rick, he obviously doubts it and forces Aaron to eat some of it first, which he doesn't want to do, supposedly because he just hates applesauce. At first, this would obviously have you like, wait, so there is something here, but once again, he is indeed telling the truth. And another thing this scene achieves very well is humanizing Aaron right away. As of now, we obviously know very little of him, but these tiny scenes of him talking about his childhood demonstrate both his honesty as well as a ton of his personality. Though once the group returns and confirms that he is indeed telling the truth, Michonne once again speaks up saying that they're going and that's final. And while everyone, including Rick, does agree, the approach they take is a bit different. In the books, they set off at first light, while in the adaptation, Rick says they'll do the complete opposite. It might be dangerous to travel at night, but in case his group is dangerous, they would be able to get away easier. And with that said, we get another episode that is up there with my absolute favorites in the entire show. Because yes, this is another nighttime shoot. But before we get to that, let us tackle the comics version first. Once they team up, shortly after leaving, they're surprised by someone waving to them on the road. This is of course Aaron's partner Eric, who Aaron never mentioned in the books. And while that doesn't make Rick exactly more confident about this whole thing, they continue their way onward. The entire journey they go on is also quite a bit different in both setting as well as the entire thing taking place during the day. Though what is by far the biggest change is what we see right before they reach Alexandria because we actually see them arrive in Washington. We would see the city itself much much later in the TV version Though in the books, we see a flare go up signaling that someone from Alexandria is in trouble. And with that, the group pushes right into the city. As I mentioned last time with Atlanta, any time the series goes into a large, large urban environment, I am all in. It's one of those things that I always thought was missing in The Walking Dead. It was established that the whole reason why they avoid cities was because of hordes, but I just love the setting so I really wish we would have seen more of that. It's one of those things that I really loved in The Last of Us and I hope they nail it for the TV version. Seeing a overgrown city is always one of those things that I really love in an apocalypse. Oh, and quick side note, this is one of a few times in the series where continuity about Rick's arm is broken. As in this panel, it definitely seems like he still has both of his hands. There are a few more instances in the book with him magically switching arms or something like that. But those are, as everyone's favorite artist would say, happy little accidents. Though in story, this is also where we meet Heath. A character that we only see in season 6. And on top of that, we already see another group of Alexandrians show up and help them take out the zombies. To cut a long story short, Heath and Scott were out on a supply run and while hopping buildings, Scott fell and broke his leg. So now the priority is getting him to Alexandria's doctors as soon as possible. And I think this approach of introducing many characters all at once is one of the things that the comic book really nails. This might just be a difference between mediums, but I feel like the TV version sometimes spent a little too much time setting up locations rather than just throwing you right into them and then explaining what it's all about. Returning to the story though, the survivors basically just group up with the Alexandrians and head off to Alexandria. In the TV version on the other hand, once the night time rolls around, we see the group split up into two cars and set out. The first minor add-in to mention is the brief exchange they have while driving. Rick notices that there are a whole bunch of number plates in the car, 
To which Aaron says that he's collecting all 50 states to put up on a wall in his house. And I think this was just another way to convey the difference in how they live and generally perceive the world. For the group, survival basically took everything, yet here Aaron was calmly talking about a collection. Something that would already be sort of a luxury in the normal world, let alone the apocalypse. Though another add-in in the scene is when Michonne gets suspicious of his claims, once he conveniently says that the reason he doesn't have any pictures of his entire group is because he got the exposure wrong. And so, she asks him the three questions of how many walkers have you killed, how many people have you killed, and why. And just as these suspicions were already rising, Rick notices the sound gun and begins to say that they may have been listening to their plan. Though unfortunately, this is another instance of me not really being able to tell you how convincing this entire thing was as I had read the books. But I think these story beats deliberately making you question, then trust, then again question Aaron's claims worked really well. Especially with the tension of the episode that we get into very shortly. And I guess with that said, this is a question I want to pass on to you. If you weren't familiar with the source material at the time, did you trust Aaron? Did that change throughout the episodes? I'm super curious to find out what people thought of him initially, so do drop those in the comments. Returning to the story though, it's here where we get into the meat of the episode. As the group is now split up in the middle of the night in a forest of all places with a horde of walkers on their tail. Somewhat similar to the book, we see a flare go up which prompts Aaron to immediately run off on his own while he is followed not because they really want to catch him, but just because they believe everyone in the RV would go to the flare as well. And just like I mentioned with the we are the walking dead moments, I'd be hard pressed to tell you which version of the story I preferred. Going into Washington and seeing the city was absolutely awesome, but the tension that the nighttime setting brings already made this one of my favorite episodes, especially with the scramble that they were already in. If you've played Dying Light, which by the way I definitely recommend, this is the type of vibe I love in my apocalypse stories. Being lost in the forest with the dead surrounding you in the middle of the night is terrifying. Another change that we've talked about at length in previous parts is that here too, Glenn is once again given a lot more spotlight, as he is the one to find Aaron and free him. Though not because he himself needs help, but rather just because he thinks it's the right thing to do. As we cut to Rick and Michonne searching for Glenn though, we get one of the most ridiculous and creative walker kills I think we've seen in the series. As Rick fires a flare gun into a walker's head and the entire thing just glows like a jack-o'-lantern. So yeah, that was pretty cool. But just as they're about to be overwhelmed, a flurry of gunfire brings the zombies down, revealing that Glenn and Aaron saved them. And notice how it's the complete inverse of what we saw in the book. This time, it's Aaron with the revolver while Glenn has the rifle. I'm not sure if this is meant to be a little easter egg for the book or not, but I do think that this implicitly says quite a bit about the difference in Glenn's character between the two versions. This will become much more pronounced when we get to Alexandria, but even throughout Season 4, Glenn had already become a much, much more serious leader type of character. Whereas in the books, he has largely remained the same since Season 1. He jokes around, he's not super serious or anything like that, and I think that gun mix-up is actually a really good way of showing that. But again, much more on this when we get into the Alexandria arc. Shortly after, the group manages to find each other and we also see Aaron reunite with Eric. And with everyone together, Aaron thanks everyone for saving Eric, and they decide to get back on the road in the morning. And another add in here, once Rick tells him that he can't stay with Eric, similar to what we've seen with Aaron already, we get another scene to flesh his character out straight away as he answers by saying that the only way he'll split him up again is by shooting him then and there. Though because Glenn's afraid of Rick actually pulling another Shut up. 
he steps in telling Rick that Aaron is clearly being honest and that they can stay together. This entire exchange is obviously a small detail in the grand scheme of things, but I don't recall any moment in the book where Glenn steps up to Rick in this manner. So I think this neatly achieves two things. It immediately shows us the type of person Aaron is. Even face to face with someone who knocked him out seconds after meeting him, he still says that he will stay with his partner and that's final. Or in other words, he's just as protective of his own as the rest of the group here. But number two, it shows us that Glenn is more than willing to question Rick's leadership and stand up for what's right. Similar to what we saw way back in season 3 after the death of Lori. And while aspects of this do happen in the book, as I've said a million times already, I do think Glenn's given a lot more agency here. The next morning, they get back on the road and, similar to the book, we see the skyline of Washington, though we don't really get much more than that. And there are a few more remixes here and there. First off, we get another added scene of the RV breaking down just before they reach Alexandria. And again, Glenn's given the spotlight as we see him demonstrate what Dale taught him way back in Season 2. And so ultimately, it's his knowledge that gets them over the last slump toward Alexandria. A bit of a remix also happens with Michonne, who largely steps in for Andrea. In the book, it's Andrea telling Rick that he can be cautious, that's what makes him a great leader after all, but that he shouldn't ruin this for everyone else. In the adaptation, on the other hand, the conversation is a little bit extended, as Michonne tells Rick that the fight is over and that he should let it go. This is both a callback to what Bob was talking about back at the church, as well as a bit of a commentary on his character overall. Rick's skepticism is the thing that might have saved their lives back in Terminus. And so I think this brief moment of reflection just before they reach this supposed safe haven worked really well for his character arc, which would basically be flipped upside down in just a few episodes. Though one last thing to add is that he does go off to hide some weapons in the woods, just like they did back at Terminus. But with that, we arrive at the gates of Alexandria and we get what I genuinely think is a perfect scene. As we linger on Rick's eyes and suddenly hear children laughing. And the confusion, disbelief and so so many more emotions that Andrew Lincoln portrays here is absolutely incredible. And just like we saw the morning after the storm, that angelic music begins to play, and just as Rick turns towards the gates, a literal ray of sunshine distorts our view, signaling a true safe haven. Though with that said, let us pick up the books and keep in mind what I just said about this being a safe haven. Shortly after rescuing Heath and Scott, both the squad of Alexandrians and the entirety of Rick's group head back to the community. Though unlike in the adaptation, we see Aaron very explicitly say, Rick, you made it. As we see the massive walls of the safe zone and the almost picturesque streets within. And just as Carl yells out in happiness, similar to what we saw in the adaptation, we linger on Rick. But you may be wondering why I said to keep in mind the thing about this being a safe haven. Well. I've mentioned it already, but in case you've forgotten, this is where the story was originally meant to end. As usual, the sources are in the description, so you can read into it a little bit more yourself. But I'll briefly paraphrase what Kirkman said about the original ending. When the story got to Alexandria, things were going to go pretty much as they did. Rick and his crew were going to have trouble fitting in, and that would lead to conflict within Alexandria where Rick would eventually take over. The big storyline No Way Out ended with Rick proclaiming that Alexandria was worth fighting for and they wouldn't keep moving from place to place. For years, that was planned to be the end. Rick would make his proclamation and the speech would end with a big close-up on Rick's face. As you turn the page, Rick's face would be the same, only it would be a statue and you'd zoom out to see the full statue with some vines growing on the bottom of it cracks forming and then you'd realize it was quite old. We'd keep zooming out until we saw the statue was in Alexandria, the same place where he gave that speech, but it was different. 
It was old, run down. We'd keep zooming out until a zombie walked by, and then another, and another, and we'd see that Rick had brought them to Alexandria and succeeded to the point that they built a statue to honor him. But in the end, the dead won. Society crumbled again, only this time, seemingly for good. I think it's safe to say that most of us are glad that the story did not end there. And while Kirkman himself says that he's a bit embarrassed by it, I honestly don't even think it's actually a bad ending. Rather, I think it's just something that most people don't want to see, if that makes sense. The undead ultimately winning really doesn't seem out of the range of possibility in the universe that is The Walking Dead. Obviously, there will always be those well, actually, people who say that the entire premise of the series is completely unrealistic, etc, etc. But I don't think that's even worth getting into. We're literally talking about a zombie series after all. Yes, they wouldn't walk around for more than a couple of years. Yes, they would freeze in the north, but come on, who cares? But anyway, that's beside the point. If you do some basic napkin math, let's say 5% of the US population is still alive. That would mean there are still over 300 million walkers out there. And as we'd see in the series itself, they have the tendency to form massive hordes. And just like we'd see in No Way Out, and later even with the Whisperers, a sufficiently large horde would just wipe Alexandria off the map. Not to mention all the things we take for granted. Medicine, for example. That would simply run out, and there are not a lot of people alive who know how to produce it let alone have the equipment to do so. People would just start dying of illnesses. So yeah, an ending where humanity does indeed crumble is possible, but again, probably not what most people, at least from an emotional point of view, want to see. And luckily, the story did indeed continue for many, many more years to come. And because we've got an absolute boatload to talk about in the Alexandri arc, and this video is already half an hour long, that is where we'll pick up next time. So to quickly sum up the differences leading into Alexandria, in the adaptation, it's just Rick's group along with Aaron and his boyfriend Eric who arrive at the gates. While in the book, a whole subgroup of Alexandrians as well as Heath and Scott travel back with them. Also, in the adaptation, before we reach Alexandria, Rick hid some weapons outside of the walls, which does not happen in the source material. But, with that being said, next time we'll be delving into the Alexandria arc. Parts of which are now actually being remixed into Season 11 and the Commonwealth of the show. So that should surely be interesting to talk about, and I definitely hope to see you there. And that's the video. Once again, this one turned out to be way longer than I expected, so hopefully I don't ramble on long enough to make Season 5 a 10-part series at this point. Though as always, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allowed me to produce even more of these for you all. And speaking of which, let us give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Riceberg. Seriously, thank you, thank you. And if you wish to join the highly coveted Mystery Shack Insiders Club, you can do so for as little as one buckaroo per month. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.